All right, everyone. So the, the last part of uh, this conference, we, uh, you know, Scott and I were, were trying to use our imagination and try to come up with an idea that might be a little different from uh, standard sorts of conferences and statistics. And uh, the idea we came up with was to have a panel discussion of uh, a few people um, you know, with, with some mix of academics and non-academics. And uh, this is what we came up with. Uh, actually, this is uh, quite a, an impressive panel. One so, academic and three very much non-academic. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, well, let's see how this all works out. So uh, let me introduce to you the panel members. Uh, so uh, all the way on your left is uh, Aaron Schatz, who is the creator of the website Football Outsiders, as well as original statistical methods like DVOA, adjusted line yards, and the Kubiak player projection system. The New York Times Magazine compared him to Bill James, and his, pro, uh, his book Pro Football Prospectus has been praised by everyone from Ron Jaworski to Peter King to Bill Simmons. During the NFL season, he writes regularly for FoxSports.com, uh, ESPN the magazine, and the New York Sun. Uh, just to his left is Dean Oliver, who is the author of Basketball on Paper, an editor of the Journal of Quantitative Analysis in Sports, and currently director of quantitative analysis for the Denver Nuggets. He has spent three years in the NBA working with coaching and management to bring a statistical perspective to decision and planning. And then we have our academic, Carl Morris. Uh, Carl joined the Harvard Statistics Department in 1990 and was chair from 1994 to 2000. He has been the editor of the Journal of the American Statistical Association Theory and Methods, and then of Statistical Science, an IMS journal. A great interest has been in the connections between statistical theory, data, interdisciplinary applications, and in the, pa uh, the panorama of statistical thinking and misthinking. The statistics of sports have been part of his classes and papers used to illustrate the theory of hierarchical modeling, experimental design, and probability modeling. Professor Morris is the faculty advisor for the new Harvard Sports Analysis Collective, which, will pre which presented two posters today. And we're very honored to have, as the moderator for this discussion, uh, Sean Grandy. Uh, Sean Grandy is considered one of the nation's premier young sportscasters. Uh, he enters his 10th season in the NBA and 7th as the voice of the Boston Celtics. Uh, Sean provides play-by-play -play coverage alongside analyst Cedric Maxwell, for all Boston Celtics games. By the end of the 2007-2008 season, only the legendary Johnny Most and current television voice Mike Gorman will have called more Celtics games than Grandy. In 2005, he became a regular host of the Fox Sports Nets, uh, Fox Sports, Nets uh, Sports Tonight. Uh, Grandy's work for the Fox Sports Network and NCAA Championship has garnered him uh, three New England Emmy nominations, and he won the 1999 Emmy for the best play-by-play. Sean made his uh, major motion picture debut with a cameo as himself in the 2001 release, Joe Somebody, starring Tim Allen, and more recently his uh, call of Ricky Davis's buzz, uh, buzzer beater in November of 2005 was used as a soundtrack in the final season premiere of HBO's The Sopranos in 2006. So please give a round welcome to our panel and our moderator. Start over here on the uh, thing, and we'll see if we want to wander around. I don't know if my bio took up the whole hour or not. Uh, I was uh, I was sitting last night thinking, how do we how do we do this? How do we best get into this conversation? And the one thing that that hit me, actually, there were two things. The first was all the times when I was a kid that my mother told me to stop playing stratomatic baseball, looking at box scores, and doing baseball stats. And now I'm at Harvard, so take that, mom. <laughs> I remember a few years ago uh, reading an article in Newsweek, it was about cartography and how the map that we are, all grew up with looking at in history class is, it was done in the 16th century by a German scientist, uh, the Mercator map I think it's called, and about 20 or 30 years ago someone had come up with using the technology of the time 
what the world map really looks like, that Africa is much bigger than we think it is, and Europe is much smaller than we think it is, and nothing really is, is where we thought it was. And it was sort of popularized on an episode of The West Wing. A couple of years later, they had done some research, and in the episode, the cartographer explains all this, and the person running the discussion, the, the press secretary, says when she looks at the map, what the hell is that? And he says, that's where you've been living all along, meaning things aren't what we thought they were, and we're starting to see that in sports and in statistics and how we look at all the games. And I guess what we want to finish with here today is how does all the things you guys have been discussing and researching, how does that translate into what it is we do and how do we use the information to become better coaches, better general managers, better broadcasters, better disseminators uh, of the information. So that was primarily what I thought of, plus I wanted to stick it to my mother for finally getting to Harvard. Uh, I think, and I want to start with Professor Morris because a lot of his work, you know, the work he's done with sports obviously is minute compared to his, his contribution to the field, but all of this begins with baseball. We all know it does because of the history of the game and because of the, uh, just the boatload of data that it, it seems easier to apply. And it occurred to me in doing what I do that the statistical revolution in baseball may be no better explained just not the proliferation of fantasy baseball or Bill James and everything, but the fact that it forced the establishment to make one change, and I'm just talking about now what I do in terms of broadcasting, that all of us grew up watching games on TV with the holy trinity of statistics, home runs, RBIs, batting average. That's what you'd see. That's what we were told was important, and now we know that we will watch a game on TV and we'll see alongside the holy trinity, we'll see on-base percentage or we'll see OPS, and for the establishment to change to that degree, that that has now become a mainstream stat, is, is a pretty remarkable thing. So, Professor, I'd ask you, when, when did that start to change? And this is a bigger question that we're going to explore. What in baseball is something we're overlooking that might become what OPS is now, 15 or 20 years from now, that we don't even consider a, a major statistic? Thanks. Uh, actually, uh you asked me about the history of when something, when, well, I see. So when, when uh, things started, uh, for me, they started with uh, George Lindsay. Uh, maybe, I don't know if anybody here knows who he was. He wrote some incredible articles in uh, 1950s, maybe, not, well, certainly one in 59 and two or a couple others about then, where uh, he pioneered what we call the Markov matrix, uh, the uh, table of expected runs. Um, so I, I have to give him a plug. But of course, things really got going for two reasons. One is we had uh, Bill James. And I have to tell you, I've only ordered one thing my whole life from the back of, uh, in this case, it was from uh, some sporting news in 1977. This little blue thing here. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know why I did this, because there were many, many things I could have ordered. I've only ordered one my whole life. But some reason, what it said in there in about three lines was appealing to me. This is the 1977 baseball abstract. It's mimeoed, and it's written by a guy named Bill James. And uh, this is the only room, by the way, in the world in which we all see that and go, yeah, oh. Yeah, we all get to look at that. <laughs> That's amazing. It cost me two dollars, and I want to tell you the note that Bill James wrote to me. It's in hand. I've never read this to anybody but you guys. Hope you enjoy the abstract. If not, let me know. I'll be happy to send your money back. Well, actually, I won't be happy, but I will send the money back. Anyway, <laughs> enjoy yourself, Bill James. I bet he now, wouldn't have made that offer today. Pardon me, yeah. <laughs> and, and I love that guy. I never, never heard of him and didn't know who he was, but I loved him ever from that moment. And uh, he went on to write, as you all know, uh, many, many years. He's the one that turned things around. And I gather awesome. uh, the big problem was... Um, People uh, like George and Lindsay had gotten some data because his father listened to many, many, many games and had written things down and he'd been able to do that, but of course we couldn't. So Bill James and uh, the sabermetricians and they all formed and they got this uh, project score sheet going and computers, laptop computers came in some order. And Bill James was not only a gifted thinker, never trained as a statistician, but he was a very gifted writer, as you all know. And the next thing we knew, thousands of people were attracted to him. The big problem for the future, of course, for most of us, including outsiders, uh, Aaron, I assume, uh, is that uh, we couldn't, uh, he couldn't get the data and we couldn't. So they had to form this project score sheet he, because the major leagues uh, husbanded their data. Uh, 
if you can give us more data, we can do a lot more in the future, and I won't say anything more for a moment. Aaron, how hard is it to accumulate uh, data? We're going to go individual in some of the individual work you've done, but just following up on that, how much harder is it to have to watch videotapes of games six months later when we're all accustomed to instant information? There are probably people in this room who are getting their email right now. Their cell phones are buzzing with text messages. We want our information now, but as valuable as your information is, it takes a while to get it out, I imagine. Yeah, it's always fun when someone calls me in February. Oh, what are you doing? Oh, I'm watching Green Bay, Green Bay play Cleveland from week five. Good times. <laughs> who isn't? Um, yeah, listen, I mean, the thing is, what I started, when I started doing this four years ago, the original stuff that I was playing with was all based on the standard play-by-play. -play. But even there, what I, I was the first person to ever take the time to, like, actually make a database of all that stuff that was, you know, on ESPN.com or whatever. But then, you know, gradually over a couple of years, you come to this realization that so much of what happens in a football game is not measured. I mean, they had the presentation about defense and baseball, but almost Everything in football is as complex as defenses in baseball, except for like field goal kicking. So, I mean, we have this armada of volunteers in our game charting project who try to add uh, data by, you know, we go back and we watch tape of the game, but in that we're limited by the fact that uh, we're using TV angles and therefore we're really missing the all 22 where you can see what the defensive backs are doing. Uh, trying to track blocking, run blocking is impossible because from the sideways angle, half the time it just looks like a big pile of fat guys. And, um, and we are also running behind because what happens is people flake out on us because they're volunteers. We don't have the money to pay them because there's no money coming in for this. And uh, so we have to go back and finish the games, you know, months later. And uh, it, this is absolutely a situation where if, if you know, the league could help us, uh, you know, if they would wanted to, wanted to track more stats. I have a whole bunch of people who would like to do it for them. Uh, but we could come up with all kinds of interesting stuff about all of those positions who, when people think about doing football work like this, they say, well, how do you do linemen? Because there's no stats for them. Well, if we track them like this, and if we could track them from the end zone angle where you can see the poles and traps, you could do a lot of stuff, but we just don't have that film, and we don't have that data. And even when it comes to the standard play-by-play, I mean, I have every play back to 1996 in a database. I don't think anyone even comes close to that, but I don't have anything before that, and everything before that we have to type in. It's not like Project Score Sheet. They've gone back and done like every single game ever in baseball. I doubt game books even exist for some games in the 60s. So. Because baseball has 162 games and 500 at-bats and the numbers we're all familiar with and the huge sample size, does football have to be done in terms of possessions, not games? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, a lot of what I do is play-by-play. Play. Yeah, it's a I mean, straight play-by-play. Play play. And if you think a quarterback has as many plays in a season as a, as a hitter who plays a 162-game season. But then when you go from position to position, it becomes less and less. I mean, a running back will have about half that many, and a wide receiver a little less than that, and a tight end a little less than that. So a lot of it has to be just sort of an acceptance that you're looking for, that the statistics are not as are not as trustworthy, that you have to look for patterns over a longer period of time, that you have to understand that sometimes things will jump out at you and turn out to be just flukes. Uh, but you know, I, I write, the, and as I write this a lot, which is the best is the enemy of the better, which means you know, the fact that we can't do things as well as baseball can doesn't mean we shouldn't try to do them. It just means that you have to accept that we're not doing things as well and that we're still in the early stages, what I, I used to call the Bill James mimeographs uh, era. <laughs> Here's the Bill James mimeograph right here, but uh, you know, you know, with the 16 game season, you accept that it's not going to be as accurate, but but there's still ways to learn things. And that brings us to to basketball, Dean. Is it again a matter of in where you, there's time and space and teams that play at different paces, which is really the issue uh, in the NBA when trying to evaluate statistics? You've sort of broken it down in terms of possessions, right? Yeah, possessions. Uh, each of our sports, baseball, football, basketball, what, we, uh, what I think the big contribution has been is, is on the framework. Uh, we set up a framework where we can talk about the game a little bit better. In baseball, they, they set up outs and, and runs created, and it leads to things like OPS. And in football, they're talking about things on a, on a play basis, on, on yards, uh, on uh, basically 
uh, increasing your odds of getting first downs and things like that, things that are actually real. And in, in basketball, we set up the possession framework, and it gives you something that you can talk about that makes a more consistent story than what has been used in the past, just points per game and, and rebounds per game and things like that. So that's, that is the framework that I'm hearing more from from fans and certainly among the people that I talk to, they're much more, the people that I work with, uh, even some of the players, they're more comfortable talking about things uh, with regards to possessions. They understand it. Possession is a very useful word. Everybody implicitly understands what possession is. Uh, so it's not that hard a transition for me to t be talking about making possessions count. Actually, coaches have been saying that for 50 years. But uh, just saying that making possessions count actually has a statistical ramification. I analyze that. I don't need to talk to the players or the coaches or management uh, about the details of how I get there. But they understand it. What has, in your work, proven to be a more important statistic in the NBA in terms of winning and losing than uh, that is one that is not talked about. It's not points per game. It's not field goal percentage. It's all the ones they feed us. I know you've, you've, you look at three or four specific ones, things like rebound percentage and turnovers per possession. What is the one thing that we who disseminate the games overlook the importance of? Uh, they, uh, certainly there are illusions um, Sometimes people get these things right. I, I think people overemphasize the fouls, um, people, people drawing fouls, people committing fouls. I think that one's overemphasized. I think we are starting to see a better balance with regard to turnovers. For a long time, people would, at a lot of levels, um, and I, I do look at the game all the way down to the high school level, junior high even sometimes, and turnovers, it's, it's amazing because a lot of the, the coaches at the lower levels are much more willing to accept new stuff because they want to move up. The people at the NBA level, they, they know a lot and justifiably they, they can question a lot of the things that I say. But the people at the lower levels, they'll accept things. That's so I get some junior high stuff sent to me. Um, but turnovers, um, turnovers are emphasized in the, in the U.S. big time now at lower levels. Don't commit turnovers, whereas that was not the case, uh, I would say, even 20 years ago, uh, at least not to the degree it is now. You see the trend in the NBA, too, where turnovers are coming down. They're still coming down a little bit, but uh, over the last 30 years, you've seen definitely a declining trend, and that, that is a very important factor for players. I think I've always felt in doing football at the college level, even on network TV, that football statistics can be the most misleading if you go in a certain direction with them. Aaron, what is value over average, as simplistically as you can explain it? You take every play, give it a sort of a rating based on how many yards it got towards a first down and in total, and compare it to a baseline for plays of the same type that are based on uh, down and distance, the situation in the game, and where you are on the field. You know, obviously, you can't throw a 60-yard pass when you're in the red zone, so that kind of comes into account creating the baseline. And express it as a percentage, where everything over 0% means more offense, and everything under 0 is more defense. It is the numbers you came up with, and I read this, uh, I was actually reading this last night, you have to sort of set what is success and what is not on a first. What is success in your system for a first down play and a second down play and then third and fourth? Right. And it also is lifted pretty much straight from the hidden game of football by Pete Palmer, uh, Bob Carroll, and John Thorne, and then fiddled with it a little bit. Uh, it's 45% uh, of needed yards on first down, 60% uh, on second down, and 100% on third down. And then there's... Um, in hidden game of football, it's a very easy system where they give two points for 80% of yards and three for 10 or more and four for 20 or more. What I've developed since then is a really complicated, curvy thingy with lots of logarithms and weirdness in it to, to make it a lot more um, gradual. But uh, longer plays are worth more, but at a certain point, they kind of, the more yards you get becomes a little less value simply because in a way, uh, if you take Willie Parker's run into the Super Bowl two years ago as a good example, I believe it was, if not the longest run given up by Seattle all year, it was like second. And it was because one guy was really out of position, Michael Bulware, the safety, and then once Parker gets past him, it's free reign down the field. Well, if that same play takes place at the 40, uh, of the Seattle 40, instead of Pittsburgh's own whatever, 15, the play's half as many yards and doesn't set a Super Bowl record, but nobody has done anything any differently. 
So actually, as plays get longer and longer, the amount of sort of value of each yard in my system becomes less and less because um, if you think about trying to rate teams in a way where you can look at what they're going to do in the future, an 80-yard pass play is really not much different from a 40-yard pass play. Carl, we talked um, last night about, about the, the numbers that Barry Bonds put up a few years ago and the uh, all political and steroid comments aside, and their, their historical place. Actually, we talked about a lot of things, uh, the professor and I did, including the fact that the three of us together with Wilt Chamberlain averaged almost 7,000 women, uh, which I thought, you know, it's all, <laughs> you can pretty much do whatever you want with stats is, is kind, of my, kind of my point there. Uh, we talked a little bit about the formula. What is that formula that you, when you compare it to Barry Bonds to Babe Ruth, things that I think are easier to do in baseball than the other sports generationally, what are the things that add into that formula that says if you had a team of Barry Bonds, he would score, you know, he would generate 28 runs a game? Yeah, uh, so Barry Bonds hit 73 home runs, maybe in 2002, but that, that's impressive. But the most, more impressive thing was that next year, uh, he was about to break, a, uh, to me, the best record in all of baseball. It was held by Babe Ruth and Ted Williams. And there's a formula that says, Given, for example, Ted Williams batting 406 the year he did in 1941, he was the last 400 hitter, and Babe Ruth in 1921 hit nearly 400 with 50 some home runs. Uh, if you could somehow imagine a lineup of nine Babe Ruths in that year or nine Ted Williams in that year, uh, then uh, how, many, how many runs would they have scored? Well, they would have scored 19, roughly. And you can tweak that a little bit, and maybe it's 19.1, 18. I wasn't even sure who was first. And then in 19, uh, sorry, 2004, uh, I knew toward the end of the season that Barry Bonds was going to break the all-time record. I think at that time he was headed for about 23 runs a game. Based, that is, if you've been able to take his performance and just uh, put it in a single game. Now, the way you do it, uh, those of you in statistics, you would just, one way to do it is just to sample, uh, randomly sample uh, independently from uh, his different options of singles, doubles, triples, homers, and walks. And he had a huge number of walks and homers and so on uh, that year, and a high percentage of hits. And you just sort of, there's an actual formula, I call it RPG. James, uh, Bill James has an approximation, runs created average. Uh, they come out pretty close. Um, that, and so to me, that was the biggest record there ever was, because that's the best thing. That's a measure of all kinds of offensive ability. It doesn't include steals, and you can, uh, certainly Bill James has tweaked that in. It certainly doesn't count defensive. But here was the all-time record that really mattered, not just number of home runs, but a guy who had averaged that many. And then he broke, uh, he tied or broke that record, I didn't tie it, but he was in that range, and I think his highest was 27 for the next three or four years. <coughs> the second best player in the entire majors all that time maybe had 12 or 13 runs per game. He was twice as good as anybody else. And uh, that's a formula you can all calculate. It's a high school level formula, really. A little bit complicated. Um, but I would move toward that kind of evaluation. And if you square OPS and multiply by nine, you begin to get into that range. Uh, it's, OPS is just an easy approximation to, to better statistics. And you can put any asterisk on it you want after you do all that math. It's yeah, up to you. Yeah, with some asterisk. Thank you. Uh, this is, uh, there are those of you in this room, I'm sure, that want to be connected to a professional team somehow, want to get into professional sports, and the path is, uh, is very different. And we're going to be, by the way, as soon as you guys have questions, start popping your hand up. Um, and all of us, no matter what it is we do in our backgrounds, we're happy to answer them. Dean, how did you make the, the transition from scouting to, to what you do now? And was it gradual? When did you start to integrate your background and statistics into this? Did you always see games as you were scouting them through these mathematical eyes? Transi uh, the transition was not short, uh, that's for sure. I, uh, the, uh, the short story, the shortened story at this point for how I got where I am is, uh, let's see. As a kid, I liked sports and science, and that's really what I thought about when I went to college. I had no idea what I wanted to do. Uh, I picked the most general thing I could. I played basketball, but <laughs> kept my hands in, in science, and I, uh, I, um, I knew the coach. Uh, I talked to the coach quite a lot. Uh, by my junior year, I was helping out the coaching staff. Senior year, I was an assistant coach and worked the Old Boys Network. I got hooked up with the Lakers. I, I uh, worked uh, as a scout for four years in graduate school. I was getting a PhD in engineering, doing some statistics stuff. 
So up through that point, I had a scouting job, which is not a great paying job, and I was thinking about uh, stats and engineering and all this. I was doing a little bit of writing at the time. I knew this is some, I knew the combination would be I would be better at the combination than I would be at either of them individually. At that time, I, I knew that. Um, I like scouting. I was pretty good at it. I could identify some players uh, I thought better than some of the other Lakers people. Um, and I liked the engineering and the stats that I was doing, but I didn't have quite the passion I thought to be the best at that. Uh, but that's where the money was, so I, I took engineering jobs, and I was doing that and doing basketball on the side until uh, I did it for nine years. And at that point, I could have either bought a house or invested in my future to uh, do sports. And so I quit my job with nothing in hand, and I, uh, I, uh, I met people like Dan Rosenbaum, who's here. He gave me opportunity to uh, speak to some people down by him, Charlotte. I went around the country. I drove around, I slept in my car, and tried to make contacts. And that ultimately led me to the Seattle Supersonics, so they gave me a chance. And sure enough, uh, the first year was just kind of an amazing year there, no doubt about it. We, uh, we were expected to finish last, and we finished first in our division. And it was, uh, it was a nice year. Uh, the management thanked me for what I did, and they kept me on. And uh, I've managed to build a reputation since then. It was, it was a fun, crazy ride. It was scary, I will say. <laughs> you guys shouldn't have to do that. See, you know, one of the things you run into, one of the things that you know, all of you certainly run into in your, in your everyday lives and certainly in front offices 5, 10, 15 years ago is, is enumeracy and the sort of lack of understanding of it. I remember being, as a kid, being given... Uh, that book to read that came out, I think, in the late 70s, called Enumeracy, apparently, because my parents wanted me to have no friends. Uh, <laughs> I, I wanted a bicycle. That's not really the... It's not really, not really here and now. Uh, and the way we disseminate and pass stats along, sometimes people just don't understand. Those of us that have even, you know, moderately mathematical minds in any way sometimes can't understand when people can't put their heads around numbers. And it's in, in what I do, it, it happens quite a bit. And I'm going to be asking these guys what it is that we can do better in the media and broadcasting games to get information out that is going to make a lot more sense. But there are things you'll deal with that you don't even think of. I'll be in game 68 of an 82-game season, and we'll be in Atlanta, and we'll be up by two in the last second. And I'll be, Max, what do you think of this last play? And he goes, well, you've got to be careful for Zaza Pachulia because he shoots 50% from the three. Max, he's one for two. <laughs> so, so, you know, there are numbers we are all trained to write down and prepare, and yet it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really tell a story. And there are some numbers, Dean and I have talked about this, uh, you know, rebound percentage in the NBA, little things like that. Um, so um, we're going to go into the audience in one second. Let me just run through real quick. Aaron, give me a football stat. I know you're a huge fan of uh, when uh, Russia rushes for 100 yards. They, yes. no, they, they, Seriously, they, do you no. want a list? Yeah, we, there's causality um, and things like that. I What's tell something? people, I mean, the funny thing is I tell people uh, I'm not out to revolutionize the way teams run their teams. I'm out to revolutionize the way journalists write and talk about the game, not to revolutionize the league. Um, yes, if I die uh, and I'm known for only one thing, it will be to the day will come when a no pregame show is the phrase, when X running back gets 100 yards, his team wins X percent of the time, ever spoken. <laughs> if I, I don't need DVOA to be on TV, it doesn't like that, man. If I can get that to happen, I will be very happy. And the other is, I would like to ban all sports writers from writing about the NFL after week one. Because it is National Jump to Conclusions Week, and it is unbelievable how little people even consider the idea of sample size that one game may not be the best way to judge from everything you knew going into that game when in week 11 you would be like, oh, an upset. But, I mean, you know, that's just two things, but there's many of them. Dean, is there an NBA number like that? Uh, we, we, you know, we're often fed when this team gets to 90 points or 100 points, and they often, you know, things like that don't tell a story because some teams are offensive teams and some teams are defensive. Is there, is there one that you've researched that you've seen tells a lot of the story that we don't use enough? 
well, let me say that we have the if so and so scores thirty points, again, <laughs> no, yeah. we've we've got analogies in the judgment on 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 one st- on cause and effect. One game, we have people a lot have of to explain that. the cause well, and effect. One play. To Actually, the the issue in the NBA is we judge players on their best game a lot. Yeah. That one happens. Uh, Probably far too much. Uh, and Some guys make $20 million off their best game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, um, I, um, it, the, the whole if they get the 90 points first, those, those work, but that doesn't tell you the how. It doesn't tell you. A coach is not going to go into his team and say, we need to score 90 <laughs> points faster than those guys do. That, that's, that's not a strategy. That's not anything that really helps a team. And uh, it may correlate to winning. It should. It, I have the same feeling about the team that wins the turnover margin. Yeah, really, the team that scores more points wins more often, too, but that doesn't tell you how they get there or what they're going to do next. You can, if you're Phil Rizzuto, you get away with saying that, but if you're not, it's, it's not. Carl, is there, is there a baseball one that, that, we don't, that you don't hear enough? Well, I kind of, uh, yes, and, and uh, first of all, uh, there are two targets. There's the fans, and there's what really counts. And if the fans care that somebody had four hits in his last eight at-bats or in his career at-bats <laughs> against some pitcher, keep telling him that. But as you just said, one for two yeah. uh, isn't that impressive, nor is, uh, you know, you just got lucky probably. Uh, I, I, uh, if, if you want to get to a better stat, uh, something like runs per game or runs created average, Bill James, it would average out for a typical player to four and a half runs a game or whatever they do, and great players would be double that. Uh, it would be better. It just means how many runs would they, that guy score together. OPS is in a, uh, the best uh, simplified version. The fans could probably understand that. And uh, a simple version of OPS would just be uh, one, one point for singles, something like 1.4 for a double, one point, maybe a seven or eight for a triple, and 2.2 for a homer, and a walk's about three quarters of a single. That's roughly OPS uh, standardized. And it, it's just a way of saying homers, it's not like slugging. Homers were not worth four singles, but it's not like batting average. A homer's definitely worth more than a single. And walks are worth are very important these days, and, and uh, making a, a guy who, who takes a lot of pitches and makes the pitcher work. I think Paul D. Podesta said to me one time, uh, <laughs> I won't hold him to this, but he said, "I'd rather see a guy get making out after ten pitches, hmm. the leadoff batter making out after ten pitches, than get a base hit on the first pitch, because if you think about the pitch count." Pitch, uh, a great pitcher on the other side. He's, uh, he, you know, not too many guys have to go ten pitches, and he's out of the game. Well, uh, we'll jump into pitch count here in a second because I had an interesting conversation with Terry Francona about that a couple of weeks ago. And I always hate it, but it's not just the broadcasters, by the way, who are guilty. Sometimes we'll all go to the ballpark and we'll look up at the scoreboard and it'll say, uh, you know, David Ortiz has hit safely in eight of his last twelve games, and very quickly we can do the math in our head that he could hit, he could have hit two ten over that time. So it's not that impressive. Question. Sure. I'm uh, Aaron Barsley. Uh, I guess my affiliation is with my website, basketballvalue.com. So as a result, I don't read as much of Aaron's stuff as I probably should about football. On a related note to your uh, stats that you would like to get rid of, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on uh, the passer rating, where that fits on that list of perhaps top 10 things to eliminate or not eliminate, and what you think might make more sense as opposed to our you know, 158.3 or whatever the perfect My biggest is. problem with passer rating is a problem that other people have with some of my stats that I'm always trying to work to solve, which is it is impossible to tell what's good because they decided to mush this stuff together without really measuring what was actually important, more important or less important of the four things, and then to make whatever, 158.3 the best, it's like you don't know, is 85 good, is 95 good, not to mention the things it doesn't include, like it doesn't take into account sacks and it doesn't consider you know, converting third downs. Uh, so, but on the other hand, the fact is, passer rating correlates with winning better than any individual statistic that is used in the standard press other than yards per pass. So it, it's good, it's just really hard to understand and I think it's kind of over leaned on and I think it could be improved upon in a lot of ways that aren't necessarily as complex as the things I do but would be easier to understand, and, uh, more accurate, and, but it's not, it actually does work out well, it's just hard to understand. Nobody understands it. Can I just uh, t- take a second on that one? Uh, a, a passer who completes two passes out of two for zero net yards uh, is above the league average. 
because it just rewards completions too much in relation to yardage. Another passer who's one out of two throwing for a first down a little over 10 yards would have a lower passer rate than when it's two out of two for no yardage. Mm. Although, uh, although it I just gets the weights wrong. I hope, pe I hope people realize not to use it with fewer <laughs> two passes. No, it's an example to illustrate <laughs> the point. Though, Max that might. <laughs> <laughs> that's, why we, that's why we don't let him do the, the BC Eagles games. But no, I mean, yeah, some of the things are, I mean, are, are, are skewed. I, have, I probably would guess that in the long run, I might think completion percentage is more important than you do, but that's generally because when you have a high completion percentage, you're moving the ball down the field and moving the chains, which gets to the first down thing that you talked about, it's and first art. downs aren't in passer rating. If you put first downs in it, it would be more accurate because then it didn't matter how you got to the first downs. What matters is getting to the first downs. Do we have another question? Here we go. Hi. Um, what would you, how much importance would you put on, like a lot of fans are beginning to start to use OPS now, and while it's a good stat, it's not a great stat, and how much importance would you put on um, trying to get them to go to the next level, or, or like how, or is there like, w is there a way that you think that fans could like somehow graduate, say from like OPS to try using VORP? Seeing, is like, will there be a day where we'll, we'll see that statistic on the TV, like we sometimes see on base percentage or OPS now? Uh, what's the word? Gor Vorp. 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 I don't know. Vorp. Vorp, um, Vorp. is a. Uh, it's a baseball perspective. I think it's a proprietary statistic that uh, measures. Uh, it's basically sort of like a runs, their own version of runs created, but then subtracted. But then you, it takes. You, you just said oh, the right above, word. Above. Uh, Above average play or something. Uh, or above oh, oh VORP, V O R P, yeah. yes. Yeah. Value above uh, replacement yeah. player. I just didn't hear the word. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no I, uh, that's a very good conceptual idea uh, to, to look at that sort of thing. But I would like to say that uh, people can suggest lots of statistics and they really need, uh, you know, and, and this is true in theoretical statistics, uh, there are lots of ways to solve a problem and we need to find the best ways. And. Uh, it, VORP is a, a fine idea, and whether they do it in the best possible way, I'd have to look at it. Can I add something? The problem is the word proprietary. Because not only is it super complex, but it's Keith Wollner's deal. In the same way, it's the same thing with DVOA, with my stat. People have asked me, would I like to see DVOA on broadcasts? And the answer is, it's never going to happen, and I don't expect it to, because it's really got a lot of complex steps to it, and it's my thing, and it's proprietary. What I would like to see the TV broadcasts do is improve the stats they use that are out there for everyone. And the thing about OPS is that it's out there for everyone. It's not, it's simpler than even runs created. It's simpler than all that stuff. It's not, it's just, it's out there, it's easy, and yet it's much more accurate than what came before. So I think that for them to use something like VORP, it's like, that's like BP's thing. And I don't know if that's quite, for the average fan, is going to, kind of get that, and I, and, and I don't know if the, the networks want to figure it, <laughs> even if they knew how. Uh, I think the idea is to make things better while keeping them still somewhat simple for the general public. Yeah, I mean, because I think that they, if you saw runs created for 27 outs, unless most of the fans had in the back of their mind that they know how that's figured and what it means, it wouldn't mean anything to them. At this point, people understand kind of OPS because it's this thing plus this thing. And those two things were always around before. People just didn't think about them quite as much. Uh, but it doesn't have like a bunch of fractions in the formula the way runs created does. So I think for the average fan, that like no, makes no, a lot more sense. The fan absolutely knows what runs created, what runs per 27 outs mean, runs per game. It, it, whether, it me whether the statistic measures it right is a different issue, but everyone understands twenty. But I think that they would say, oh, does that, I mean, the average person would say, oh, is that, is that the times he crosses the plate, or is that the runs? See, runs and runs batted in, I think, makes sense to the average because they represent actual events. <laughs> runs created represents sort of a nebulous, like, uh, it just means run. we think this is kind of what's, what this guy's doing, right? But it's not, it's like they can't, it, there's nothing concrete that they can put their mind on and go, oh, that's when he walks across the plate, that's a run. Yeah. So I think that's for the, the dudes and the fans with the be in the stands with the beers. I think that that might be tough for them to go runs created. What the I mean, how are they created? You what's know? It, what's interesting to me about OPS and pass rating is that they are ratings. They are not real. You don't count those things. Basketball doesn't have a rating that gets uh, 
when we put it up there, we put up points per game, rebounds per game. We don't have a rating that gets put up there. The fact that baseball now has essentially a rating up there is kind of interesting. I don't know if it's good or bad. Why should we have a better rating up there or not? I mean, you say it's it's kind of a great thing. I'm not I, I sure I can convert that to I how many it's, extra it's games good. you'll win if you have one guy with, you replace one guy with another guy. You just take the difference of these things and, and multiply by 10. That's how many extra games you'll win. Dean, we, we get inundated with so much information in the NBA. I know John Hollinger has come up with a, with ratings, efficiency yeah. ratings for players. Uh, is that is that a useful tool? How does he, for people who aren't aware of it, how does he come up with that number, and could it ever catch on the way a quarterback rating it? I, I think it could catch on because I, I, the uh, <laughs> intelligence of the public can never be underestimated, as somebody said probably several times. Um, I think that, and that's no offense to, to Purr or anything like that, it's just that um, ratings in general get out there without necessarily questioning the validity of them. What are you really rating? In basketball, it's very hard to rate a player. It's very hard to put football players on, a, on an equal scale of, of, of rating. We have a quarterback rating. We don't necessarily have a universal rating across football players. Um, and so I'm, I think we will probably end up with some sort of rating on basketball players showing up in broadcast. Is it a, is it a good thing? I don't know. I, I like, um, and we talked about this a, a little bit before this, I like telling a story. If you get a rating that tells a, a clear story about what's going on, then it's useful. And in my mind, the story that can be told about basketball is what you see on the court, but also how statistics can clarify that picture of what you see on the court. It's so easy to see the highlight real stuff and miss the rest of it that sometimes stats can capture. And I think that is a better story to put up there in terms of the numbers. I don't think anything hits more at the heart of what we're discussing now than that statement, which is telling the story with the stats that they're only useful to the people in the front offices and they're only useful to people like me if we can take them and explain to our audience or to our team that's trying to sign a free agent why this specific thing matters. Here's a pet peeve I have, and you'll, if this is something you've never noticed, you will. Notice when you're watching a game on TV how many times you hear the announcer simply read the numbers that are on the screen rather than supplement that information with what it actually means. And it's a, to me, it's a, yeah. it's a total pet peeve. It drives me absolutely nuts, and I try very hard not to do it. But that's not thinking, and they just become, they just become numbers that way. Uh, again, throw your hands up, and we got uh, mics coming around. But this is something that was kind of, uh, kind of bugging me, which is the proliferation of fantasy sports, which I'm sure many of us in this room play. Is it good for what we're talking about, or is it bad? Because on the one hand, it's brought more awareness to numbers, Aaron. On the other hand, it's brought awareness to not necessarily the numbers that are the ones that tell the story. I have to constantly tell people on radio interviews that our book is not a fantasy football book. So, I mean, I love fantasy football, and I write about it, and we aim the book a little bit more towards it than the stuff we do during the season. But there is this image, baseball, BP people get, it, get this same stuff that I get, which is the idea that if it's numbers, it must be your fantasy geeks. When actually we're out there doing like ratings for offensive lines and secondaries and things that have nothing to do with fantasy. And they're out there, you know, talking about how stolen bases are kind of pointless unless you can do it two out of three times. When, of course, in fantasy, guys who steal a bunch of bases are, you know, great. Juan Pierre or whatever. Uh, Craig Massey from San Diego State. I was, first off, Aaron, I just want to say if you're looking for new uh, camera angles for... Uh, Lineman, you may want to talk to Bill Belichick about that. He might be able to help you out with that. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but um, more so, and if you guys want to get back to this in a little bit, I kind of wanted to uh, ask you guys what you guys felt about some things off the field and off the court as far as, like, econ, finances, in the sense that, like, I've just been seeing a lot of players recently that are in contract years, their stats go up big time. And I'm curious if you ever thought about modeling or trying to look at that situation, and especially like, for example, I'm, uh, Tony Romo comes right off the bat. Th I'm thinking of him. He's in a contract year. And he's ha not that he hasn't performed well, he's just having a great year this year. Do you think there's a real significant relation between contract years and, and performance? I have no idea. It's, yeah. on one of, it's like one of the things on the big list of stuff to study. I'd probably actually hand it off to somebody with more statistics experience than I have. But I know BP's done it for baseball, and I think they found out that there is an effect in baseball. In, uh, in basketball, it's believed. It, it tends to be believed at the managerial level. Uh, the, I have seen academic studies 
none of which is completely satisfactory to me, and they generally don't find it. Yeah. And I, I think the issue also with that is you end up with a rule of thumb, and you can't use rule of thumbs all the time. Um, it, it, some guys are. It, say you come out and you say statistically significant 60% of the time, yeah, they're, they're going to play better. Well, if it's your own guy, how much, are you going to believe that 60% or are you going to believe what you're seeing and you think you've seen some true improvement, things that will carry over? Um, I don't know how valuable a rule of thumb that would be. The, the other problem with football, by the way, is that you definitely run into the issue where of the sports, of the, these three at least, that football is the one where, by, where it's hard to separate a single player from his 10 teammates, the system that he's in, and the calls of the coordinator. And so if you had a running back in a contract year and he was going out there trying to prove himself, but then his left tackle and his center got hurt for the year, I mean, you know, he wouldn't have good stats. So you'd also have to kind of take into account the fact that, you know, part of the reason why Tony Bromo can go off is that uh, uh, Terrell Owens' uh, finger is okay this year or whatever, and the offensive line is still all healthy, and et cetera, et cetera. It's a good example to me of, of the story behind the numbers that we always have to – there's two sides to it. All right, Tony Romo's having a great year. Is he in a contract year? It's the kind of thing that we want to, you know, tell the complete story. You know, as I sat in here before and I, I tried to uh, expand what limited IQ I have to understand the excitement expectation of soccer matches. And, I, you know, I got, a, I got an understanding of the graphs and what happens and the probability of a, of a draw. But to me, as I sit there and look at that, I think, well, what's the probability of one team beating another – when, say for a random example, the coach pulls the goalie who's had four consecutive shutouts to go with a goalie who basically hasn't played in three years and you lose four nothing. I mean, there's, there's more. You've got to be able to find something that it, the best case scenario for someone like me is a number that satisfies my mathematical side. Uh, it's like the old, uh, you know, it's that the Frosted Mini Wheats commercial where you have the, you know, the, the wheat side and the sugar side and you, have, you want to satisfy both the mathematics side, but there's a good story behind it, too. This is more a question for Dean and Aaron, I think. Um, with baseball, the, the observational data has continued to improve from box score to pitch by pitch to pitch FX, you know, and so on, you know, complicated fielding statistics, whatever. Um, how, much, how much in your respective sports do you think that can be gained uh, through greater codified observation? And I, I guess what do you see as a result of using that data? Do you think? In basketball and football. I, I, I'll tell you a lot, a huge amount. Uh, in basketball, there's still so many things we can't explain, uh, we can't predict uh, based on the data sets that we have. Uh, there, there are things in the game, we acknowledge so many uh, things that we can't capture, even with the non-box score related evaluation, the adjusted plus minus um, kind of stuff that Dan presented this morning. It may tell you something about a player's productivity, but it's not giving you all the insight into why. Or it may give you partial insight, but then there's a, there's a black hole, and you gotta fill that in, and we have ideas for where those can be. Um, I know I, I have been talking to the league. We are gonna be collecting more stats. They're gonna be unofficial for a while. Um, but there are gonna be things that show up over the next few years. Um, I'm hoping, like on the defensive side in particular, uh, things like how often a player allows penetration, this kind of stuff. We, we should be able to see some of this uh, showing up in the NBA as at least unofficial stats over the next few years, and it's going to make a big difference for filling in gaps. Um, shots defense, these are things we talk about. It's not clear the timeline, but they, they will happen. And at the same time, it's not going to solve the problems. <laughs> what collecting more data does is it answers some questions, but it also raises plenty of others. And the more data we have, there is a lot of data in basketball. At some point, we've talked about how much data there is in baseball. And we get the sense that baseball is kind of closing the number of, the number of questions to be answered is getting smaller. I don't necessarily think that's the case. Um, they just may be getting more focused, and that's what you're going to see in basketball, too. You know, you didn't ask me, in, uh, in, uh, so I won't answer it in general, but uh, uh, I, I think uh, a win in baseball is worth about $2.5 million in the sense of what, or maybe $3 million for an extra win. That's about what they'll pay people who can win one more game. I wonder what those numbers are there, and why aren't we relating these things to winning? 
that's what the that's what the management wants to do. They have to hire people, and prospectively in the future, they have to try to increase the number of wins. You can also evaluate what happened in the past, and that's different statistical problem. You can just measure that, but in the future, you have to figure out what your measure will be. Particularly in the world in which we all operate in professional sports, with salary caps and trying to maximize the value of each, you know, of each player and each uh, each dollar. Also, um, lots in football. I could like get into it for twenty minutes, but it's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And I think uh, the value of a win in the NBA. There's someone did a paper a few years ago. Um, I think it's one to two million dollars. Okay, not as high apparently as in baseball. So what's that, the random example, if you were to multiply that by, say, 24 wins, if a team happened to have um, so, three, three all-stars? Is that what this is saying? at the margin. This isn't the win one game versus yeah, zero. Yeah, number of good revenue is just 24. But I think uh, uh, better statistical work and, and cleaner work could win, be worth a couple of wins to teams. And that's, uh, we wouldn't have to pay us anything like that to uh, get that kind of <laughs> Hey, guys. Uh, Kenny from Columbia. Um, I wonder if, what do you think about the interaction between a community like ours and the sports gambling community? Because I imagine there must be some real experts in, like, in Las Vegas or something doing all the handicapping, and they might have some really interesting models for all kinds of sports. But of course, it's not public. And I sort of think the, the best statistical models are those that have real predictive power, as opposed to those that go back and do retrospective analyses of things that happened decades ago sometimes. Um, do you think, or do you know of, not, not strategies to make us money, but I, I don't know, is it taboo even? Like for Dean, you work for a team. When I run a regression to try to predict a logistic regression to see if a team's going to win a basketball game, the best predictor by a long shot is the spread. Just one number. They do a pretty good job, right? The, uh, so what do you guys think about? It, um, Are you thinking of becoming an NBA referee? The Vegas, uh, it is a little bit of taboo. Of course, there's some sensitivity uh, right now in the NBA side, big time. Uh, and gambling has never been at all in, in my mind. I, as I say, I went through coaching and playing and stuff, and if you want to keep a career on the basketball side, you don't you don't do anything. I don't I don't bet on anything, um, just to avoid that linkage. Um, on the other hand, I do know people who know things about how they do stuff in Vegas. How do they make money doing that? Um, and they do sophisticated modeling. I don't know the details about it at all. Um, I hear some of the the range of values that they have on player values and things like that but i don't know how they do it and they are doing some good stuff uh that taboo prevents me from really investigating that much more than occasional stories it's less taboo for me because being a journalist and not really writing for a team work for a team or anything but um i mean there's there's no doubt but you're right but at the same time they keep that stuff quiet so that other people don't win, and uh, so why would they even want to share it with me? But I certainly am willing to talk to anybody who has ideas, uh, except for when I forget to email them back, which is a life. Uh, but uh, I do think that if you look at the over-unders before the season over the last couple of years, we've definitely noticed that the preseason over-unders have gradually moved to being closer and closer to the stuff we do. So I don't know whether that's us having an impact or someone in Vegas with a, with a you know, because they set the over-unders based on the public, you know, betting lines. And, and some of them are still different, you know. But, um, and as far as, I mean, the fact is, I, I'm, I'm, I've, I have played around with the idea of doing a pick against the spread formula using my stuff and some other variables and selling it as sort of a premium product. Because, I, I mean, the fact is that not working for a team, I work for myself. I've got guys who write for me. I want to give them money because they're nice and they do stuff. And so, you know, this is a way to possibly make money. I haven't done it yet. But, uh, you know, at, at the same time, it's not a group of people. That, you know, I, I would never want to be associated with gamblers. The only thing about football is that there's enough people out there who gamble for 30 bucks with their buddies for the season in like an office spread pool that it's not really like a bunch of degenerates would be coming to my house. I mean, you know, the secretary at your law firm probably is in the office pool. It's a little bit different than the other sports. 
You see De Niro playing, playing Aaron in a movie like 20 years from now? <laughs> this whole system. Probably Dustin Hoffman instead, I guess. Uh, Matt Tom from testing this thing off. Uh, Matt Tom from Manual College. Uh, as uh, there's turnover in ownership of teams, do you find that uh, the reception to using statistics in sports or more advanced statistical techniques in sports uh, has changed or has grown? Uh, it seems like newer owners like Mark Cuban or uh, I guess the Patriots' current management are more receptive. Uh, do you find there's sort of a changing of the guard and that affects statistics in sports? And if so, where in that process are we? Yes, <laughs> that's for sure. It, uh, it has changed. The, uh, yeah, a lot of the new owners are understanding that uh, the way you run a basketball team is not as dissimilar from uh, running your own business as kind of it used to be. Um, you want to have some metrics to track things, and it is going there. I think um, Dan, who works for the Cleveland Cavaliers, has, uh, has some of the benefit of that. That's a, a new owner in Cleveland who came in, and I think I saw an interview with him when he bought the team saying, yeah, he wanted to go and bring in that that ability to do metrics on what project on, on projects associated with basketball operations and there's growth without the oper with the, without the coach turnover as well uh, management's going there as well that I think we've got seven teams in the NBA that probably have uh, at least one person dedicated to stat stuff uh, that's seven more than there were three four years ago it's, it is evolution. There are younger owners coming into the NBA and professional sports who have maybe made their money in other businesses which have relied more on statistical analysis. So there's, there's two different ways you know, that, that it can change, and it has and it, it will continue to. Older people get married to their ideas, and this is the way things change. Uh, that's what Thomas Kuhn wrote on, on, uh, on the uh, scientific uh, uh, evolution, revolution. Uh, was that the real paradigm isn't that people change their minds, it's that they get old and younger people replace them. Patrick Joyce, University, oh, sorry. Uh, Patrick Joyce, University of Connecticut. Um, nowadays we're seeing more and more owners, especially as cost certainties come into place, which are, I guess, flush with cash. Most of the NFL, the Boston Red Sox, uh, the New York Yankees, uh, even the Toronto Maple Leafs turn, uh, end up creating large, large profit every year. In light of that, and as almost related to the other question, there are many of us in here who spend a lot of time desiring to be involved in sports someday. And you know, we do it when we're seven years old. We want to, you know, everybody wants to be the clutch hitter for the Boston Red Sox. Um, my, bas my basic general question is: um, as we look forward in the future, now, today, tomorrow, um, what, um, what kind? Um, what does the future look like for the possibility of math, math, highly mathematically trained statisticians within the uh, ranks of professionals, uh, working within the offices of professional sports or other, other sporting uh, um, avenues? I, I can handle one thing quickly. Uh, uh, the, the fellow, uh, he's from BU, but he's been teaching the sports class at Tufts. He was trolling today trying to, is he still here, Andy? Uh, he was trying to find out today if uh, uh, you, where the interns are. He's been asked by the professional teams. Uh, I think the word intern, though, is a code word for we won't pay you. Uh, we'll it's it's you not a, a code word. That's actually what it means. <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to be Magic Johnson, Ricky Henderson, or Tony Dorsett. Nothing having to do with Boston. Uh, coming from the West Coast, it was random. And coming from Hawaii, where we had no home team. It was just you pick a sport, uh, pick a team in whatever sport. Um, that avenue, I have a hopeful goal. I'd like to see front offices uh, expand kind of the talent pool, the thinker pool, the diversity of that pool um, that makes decisions. Uh, it's a turtle pace right now. Uh, but it's going there. I think we've seen benefit in other areas, uh, in financial market, uh, 
financial people, Wall Street, they hire people from all sorts of disciplines, and that, that helps. Uh, and I think there are enough people who are owners who recognize that that diversity of thought um, with a fairly common set of tools, but diversity of thought, can lead you to make better decisions. Plus, Bill James says there's no such thing as a clutch hitter, so that, that wasn't going to happen anyway. Uh, hi, my name is Imhotep Royster. I'm a senior here at Harvard. Uh, my question is for Mr. Oliver specifically. Um, you've already said your aversion to uh, player ratings, I guess, but what's your opinion of uh, the work of David Barry in the Wages of Wins, specifically his uh, wins produced and wins score metrics? I, uh, the, the technique I have, Dave is a friend of mine, and he had a paper in 1999 where he put out an earlier version of, of his metric. And I went back and forth with him over email for about a year to try to improve that. And uh, he improved some limited aspects of it, but the, uh, the criticism that was raised this morning with regard to it being uh, derived from team stats and applied at the individual level is one that I raised long ago, and I still have that concern. Um, because I don't spend as much time really using player ratings, um, it doesn't trouble me quite as much, uh, I think, as other people. Uh, I, don't use, I, I don't use it in practice. Um, that, that's my bottom line. I, I, I have to look at it because it gets brought up often enough that I have to calculate it. I have to calculate per. I have to calculate all the linear weights things that are out there just so that I'm aware of them, but I don't use it to make decisions. Anyone else? Wayne Rockerby. I'm probably the only Canadian in this room, <laughs> and uh, as such, I'm going to ask a loaded question, one other Canadian, perhaps. One league that's being ignored. Congratulations here on your dollar, by the way. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, that's something. Um, the one league that hasn't been talked about here is the National Hockey League today, and uh, the NHL has done a tremendous job in improving statistics on its website. I know because I had several students who were employed by the NHL and they hire eight to ten people who sit at every game and watch every player go on the ice and track what, exactly what they do until the player goes off the ice. And they provide these statistics on their website. And there really aren't any other statistics you could measure in hockey other than these statistics. It's very exhaustive. And I'm assuming the reason they do this is to public demand, not because they want to measure productivity of players or whatever it is, that they find it profitable to do this, and the public wants to see this on their websites and so on. The NFL's done this. They put play-by-play -play data on their websites and so on. But I'm curious about the NBA. The NBA does not provide uh, very much on its website. And I'm wondering, is that because they feel that the public doesn't really demand these statistics, that they're not interested in them. Uh, actually, you, you provide some inf interesting information for me. I, I didn't realize that the NHL had such great stats. I, I, I wouldn't have guessed that the demand was there. Um, <laughs> and uh, maybe I'm alone in this room on that. The, uh, I, my under I heard a story back in the late 90s about how when the NFL embraced fantasy football, that made a huge difference for them. It, it increased their revenues ton. They started putting more stats out there. It was, it was just great for them. Um, fantasy basketball has not really ever taken off. Uh, it, it still sits below fantasy football and fantasy yeah. baseball. If there are people out there that know better, uh, Feel free to correct me, but the uh, the NBA does like collect. They want to collect stats, but there is also a cost, and the the, um, the cost of collecting stats in a game that is moving very fast is, is challenging. Uh, they have three people, I believe. So there's two people, two stat people, and a spotter at NBA games, and then to get more people, it's not. And it's not necessarily even that you're paying them. You, get, you could get a volunteer, but where do you put them? Um, because those guys are down on the court, and where do you put them is part of the, the issue there. Uh, they want to do more. 
the, the right now they're dealing with cost issues. Hey, Dean, you and I were talking uh, before we started about, about the NHL, and I'm a big hockey guy myself, that uh, is technology improving to where it's really more – in a, a game that's like jazz, that is constantly fluid and flowing in hockey, much more so than basketball, can you chart things now that you couldn't five, ten years ago through computer technology, whatever, where players are on the ice, where scoring chances are created? Is that – yeah, absolutely. Could I take that for Please. just a second on behalf of one of our students, Andrew Thomas, who's just written a paper and submitted in the same journal where some of us who can put our papers in. He's broken the hockey uh, – uh, uh, the ice down into about 15 different regions, and he can sit there all by himself, watch a hockey match, and watch the puck move throughout the entire match and analyze it according to a Markov model. It's quite creative. So I think uh, one person can do that, and I don't know if it could in basketball. But I know Unfortunately for the NHL, that's about what the attendants are averaging right now, which is the poor <laughs> reason we're not discussing them a lot today. <laughs> hey, it wouldn't be my choice. <laughs> the, those technological advantages will catch up and help us. They... Uh, it's, uh, there are other things that I think are higher on the NBA's priority list. Uh, the NBA is, 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 uh, generally embraces progress. There are just a lot of things that they're dealing with. And I think when things get established to the point they can be used in the NBA without interfering with the product uh, as it is right now, uh, they'll embrace it. Yeah, Dan Hurland, San Diego State. I just, I know you mentioned about a lot of different statistics that they're starting to produce. I was actually interested in football as well, but I guess Aaron had to leave. But I think are he's these... putting quarters in his meter. <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> Which is what I He didn't doing calculate the well. stats right of quarters yeah. per 15 minutes. But are these, are these statistics available? And if so, where can you get them? These uh, new statistics that they're, as, they're, as they're being created and as they're being modeled, are they available to, say, us if we wanted to do some modeling on our own? Are these... Statistics available. Uh, the uh, yeah, publicly available stats are not there yet. They, uh, I, I, I think the NBA is uh, is putting out more and more stuff. The shot chart stuff that came out on the NBA website this past year is an example of putting more out. The uh, the the list of things that they want to do is still so large that uh, they're just making incremental progress. I don't, there's no intent to keep uh, too much of that stuff private. I think, um, I, don't, I don't know what their official policies are for releasing um, just raw data to students or anything like that. people who want to do research. Uh, I haven't asked them for that. Uh, a lot easier for baseball, but not that easy. Yeah, one more. Somewhere. Good hustle, Scott. Oh, uh, I, I'm still Peter Vint with the Olympic Committee, and, and I just wanted to chime in with the, the technology issue because um, while it sounded like the, the hockey program or the, the data that your, your student collected in hockey was probably a video-based tool, and there are a number of match analysis type tools that can log information, usually through either keystroke or pressing a mouse button, or now we're able to use voice recognition to be able to essentially narrate a game and have those exactly time-coded in with what happens in the match. But there are some brilliant technologies that are starting to emerge that are based on GPS that are able to track in real time, real position, outdoors, of course, um, exactly where players are right now on a, on a soccer pitch or a rugby pitch and stream that data together with video. And by the end of the match, you've got more than you can possibly do. So kind of the, the days of you know running and rerunning tape and and uh, tagging everything very manually, I, I think, are, are rapidly going away. And as some of these GPS technologies evolve and are being driven by gaming industries and also motion picture industries with multi, you know, multiplayer battle scenes and stuff like that, that this is, we'll see that come to support as well. Uh, but the, there's some pretty fascinating things around right the now. The stuff that you showed earlier with the, uh, the soccer, I saw that software that was up there. I'd actually be curious to talk to you about that. I'd, there was a paper in JQAS, I don't know, a couple of issues ago on soccer, and it sounds, it looked like from that paper what they were asking for was pretty much the kind of data that you were showing on there to better improve the model that they had, and I thought that was, yeah, that could be very interesting. I guess Aaron, the last question is, did you get a, uh, did you get a ticket? Did you feed the meter in time? What? No, it's a medical <laughs> issue.
Oh, sorry about that. Uh, I want to thank uh, all of you for, for having us today. It was, uh, I know for most of us up here, it was something, uh, something a little bit different, and uh, we appreciated the, uh, appreciated the interaction. So I know it's been a, uh, a long day. Scott, you want to come wrap it up? Thanks, Mutter. Uh, so, thank you again to all the panelists. Um, so we'll have a, a, just a couple of announcements before we close. But uh, first of all, uh, before we do that, I'd like to ask uh, the uh, uh, department chairman of the uh, uh, Department of Statistics here at, uh, here at Harvard, uh, Professor Shaoli Meng, to come up and say a few words. Don't be scared, this, this will be quick. Uh, sports and statistics has always been closely associated with each other, even in jokes. For, for example, soccer is about 22,000 people who need exercises watching 22 people who don't. And uh, perhaps, in statistics, uh, perhaps in US, the 22,000 should be 2,200. Um, I guess after a long day of uh, formula and numbers, you don't need more, uh, more numbers here. But I, the only thing I want to emphasize here is that statisticians not only study sports, but actually we do sports. I guess that you, um, you, you have heard during the opening ceremony, which uh, unfortunately I could not be here because I was trying to catch up on my weekend running program before my doctor showed me more about you know, uh, statistical studies, why exercising is, 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 is good for health, and, uh, which he has done once for me already. And I guess what you heard this morning is that uh, the uh, uh, the two co-organizing of the meeting has, uh, they are really uh, very uh, athletic, uh, especially before Mark got injured, I heard. Uh, um, I don't know how many of you know that a skull actually holds many uh, amazing records, and one of which was he and his dad collectively scored 74 points in one single basketball game. Now, if you don't think that's impressive, his dad only scored two. So. <laughs> I want to give you another example. Uh, take a look for my great colleague, uh, Professor Carl Morris. I guess no matter how, matter, how matter how much ego we all have, it's hard to admit, it's hard not to admit, Carl is the, is simply the most charming statistician alive. I, I guess um, un undoubtedly in my mind that Carl's lifelong passion for sports, in particular for tennis, not just for watching it, but for playing it, has something to do with his ability to keep his body and his mind so beautiful for so long. And uh, um, so, it, indeed, for most of us, doing some f form of sports is about maintaining a healthy and active lifestyle. In that sense, it is particularly fitting for ASA board, uh, ASA sports and chapter, or BCAS, to organize this wonderful symposium, because BCAS is simply one of the most healthy and active AS chapter. Indeed, uh, among ASA's 77 local chapter, BCAS is the second largest one with 428 members only surpassed by the Washington, D.C. Uh, chapter, which has six, 764 members. So I, I just here want to congratulate uh, the BCAS for doing another wonderful job, and uh, um, I hope that uh, they will organize another one in the future. Thank you very much. We want to thank everybody for, for coming uh, before we completely let you go. Um, we'll, we're going to plan on, at some point uh, this evening, probably around 9 o'clock afterwards, we're going to be at John Harvard's if you want to just kind of uh, hang out and celebrate this, uh, you know, the, the um, accomplishments of, of uh, this uh, conference. Um, for those of you who aren't sure where to go to dinner, uh, we conveniently photocopied some uh, Google Maps with restaurants on them and we'll place them outside. So once again, thank you all for coming, and I hope you enjoyed the conference.